please be seated. This evening, we are proud to have as moderator an alumnus of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Javan Lewis operates in the capacity of Tourism Key Results Area Manager at the Performance Management and Delivery Unit in the Office of the Prime Minister. He was a recipient of the Arthur Lewis Undergraduate Award and a 2018 graduate of the University of the West Indies Cable Campus, where he completed his BSc studies for a double major in Management and Economics. Prior to his assumption of the position of Tourism KRA Manager, Javan served as an economist in the Research and Policy Unit of the Department of Finance and also taught principles of business and economics at the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School. He graduated from the South Lewis Community College in the year 2013 and did his A-levels in economics management of, of business and sociology. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our moderator for this evening, Mr. Javan Lewis. His Excellency, Mr. Cyril Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, Dame Paulette Louisi, Governor General, Emerita and Chairperson of the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee, Honorable Joachim Henry, Minister of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, and Parliamentary Representative for Castri Southeast, Her Excellency, Dr. June Sumar, Chairperson of the Open Campus Council of the University of the West Indies, our esteemed lecturer, her Excellency Lief Escalona, Ambassador of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to St. Lucia. His Excellency Peter Chen, Ambassador, Amb Peter Chen, Ambassador, Embassy of the Republic of China, Taiwan. Other members of the Diplomatic Corps, Dr. Adrian Auger, Caribbean La um, Laureate of Arts and Letters, and he would like me to say disciple of Walcott and Lewis. Ms. Fortuna Anthony, Deputy Chairperson of the Board of Governors of the South Lewis Community College and members of the Board of Governors. Monsignor Patrick Anthony, founder of the Folk Research Center. Dr. Merle St. Clair Auguste, Principal of the South Lewis Community College. Managers, staff, students of the South Lewis Community College. Former deans, Mr. Cedric Charles, Senior Manager, Investment Banking Services. Bank of St. Lucia, our main sponsor, Mrs. Soraya Best Joseph, Divisional Head Marketing and Communications, Marcy Stores, members of the National Nobel Laureate Festival Committee, Honorable Justice Gregory Regis, retired judge, the Kiwanis Club, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, our online audience, good evening. Allow me to welcome you to the Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Lecture. And let me first acknowledge that this is the 30th anniversary of the Nobel Laureate Festival. So congratulations to the National Nobel Laureate Festival Committee and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College for the role that they play in sustaining the annual celebrations for that period. Another hearty round of applause to them. This year's theme, Celebrating Excellence, Nurturing Our Creativity, consolidating our legacy. In many spheres of the economic field, Sir Arthur Lewis is known for his great interest in world development and the process by which economic differentiation between the rich and the poor countries had come about and how it can be reversed. It is clear that this interest wasn't just one of mere economic, one of, of mere economic interest However, but one which was developed through experiencing the realities of living in a small island developing country, our very own home, St. Lucia. Faced with many challenges, both economic and social, it is critical to celebrate the excellence within our society and our country, as this is what will act as motivation for so many to strive to great levels. Celebrating excellence also allows for the caring and encouragement of creativity within our society and strengthens the great legacies which will go on to propel future generations to endeavor 
unto appreciable journeys of life. The title of this evening's lecture, Sir Arthur Lewis and Racism, Growing Inequality and the Right to Development, Destruction of Civilization. This illustrates how an exceptional economic mind was compelled to focus on development economic theories which transcends into the dynamic of the social fabric that continues to exist today. I look forward to the presentation by our esteemed lecturer, our Honorable Excellency Dr. June Suma, who will delve into it all. But at this point in time, let me invite the, a student of the South Lewis Community College, Ms. Jenilee Henry, to serenade us with a beautiful voice. Good evening, everyone.
just like the theme states, we need to definitely nurture creativity and what a talent we have on our hands. I guess the South Louis Community College will take great care of us. Yes. At this point in time, we have now come to the feature presentation for this evening. Um, please direct your attention to the screen for the introduction of our esteemed lecturer. Be heard now? That is right. So I have to say all of that back. <laughs> all right. So at this point in time, we we come here and we have now our feature presentation for this evening. So I will please direct your attention to the screen for the introduction of our esteemed lecturer. Thank you. Her Excellency Honorable Dr. June Suma is a career diplomat who is often described as a woman of first. She is the first woman to receive a PhD in history from the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus, the first woman to serve as St. Lucian Ambassador to CARICOM and the OECS, the first woman to serve as an OECS Commissioner, the first woman to be ratified as the Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States and the first woman to perform the role as chair of the Open Campus Council of the University of the West Indies, a post she currently holds. Dr. Suma received her PhD in history from the University of the West Indies in 1994. Her thesis, entitled An Assessment of the Factors Affecting the Structure and Functioning of the British West Indies Federal Civil Service, 1947 to 1962, accentuated her deep passion for regional integration and both directed and fueled her career path. Dr. Suma has diverse experiences through her work in the diplomatic, financial, and education sectors obtained through over 30 years of academic and professional experience, functioning at the managerial, operational, and technical levels. She has a sound understanding of contemporary development issues and is currently writing a sustainable development plan for the British Virgin Islands. Dr. Suma has received numerous local, regional, and international awards, including, most recently, the St. Lucia Cross for distinguished service in the fields of education, diplomacy, regionalism, and development speciality in February 2021. She has also received the Pelican Award from the University of the West Indies as a distinguished graduate of the decade and outstanding leadership on the 70th anniversary of the University of the West Indies Cavill Campus in 2018. Dr. Suma has authored several papers and presented on reparations and the place of women in the society. Her favorite pastime is cricket. She has published on the sport and analyzes its impact on regional integration. Her truest passion, though, is history. It is the grounding in history that energizes her focus on equity and equality in sustainable development for the Caribbean. She therefore feels duty-bound to ensure that the people of the region understand and appreciate their history. Ladies and gentlemen, Her Excellency, Honorable Dr. June Suma.
esteemed ladies and gentlemen, if the Governor General acting will permit me, I will adopt the protocol that has been established, but want to recognize you so personally and also to recognize the Impulet Luisi. The... Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, Governor General Emerita, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, including my family, who came to support my support system. I have my own crew. Thank you very much for being here. Tonight, um, you will hear the words of Sir Arthur Lewis. When I started the journey in writing this paper, I didn't think that he had written so much on that topic. But I spent a lot of time in the library at Keyville over the last couple of weeks reading his work, and I want to share that with you this evening. And it is my honor, really and truly, to be doing this. It's, it's the third time that I am doing it. I was telling somebody earlier that I have lectured on empowerment in the work of Sir Arthur, on constitutional advancement in his work, and now on racism and equality and the right to development. I know everybody's wondering about the last part of the presentation, the destruction of civilization, and they're wondering what is she going to talk about at this point? Translated into our problems, the black group is disadvantaged by its past. It is pressured into believing that it cannot catch up because its culture is non-competitive. A situation has been created in which equilibrium is not equality attained and sustained by natural ability, but rather a basic inequality partitioned by racial, religious, gender, and other barriers. When one includes discrimination and monopoly, minorities are greatly handicapped. These words were written by the Nobel Laureate in 1985 in a paper entitled the economics of racial inequality. And this presentation posits that this perceived inability of people from the Caribbean and Africa to catch up was at the heart of his life's work. He was paving the way for a genuine equality, not encumbered by skin color, tone, or shade. Fully cognizant of the continued exploitation and barriers erected against people of African descent, Arthur Lewis spent his entire life attempting to provide strategic and innovative solutions to structural post-colonial inequalities and racism to ensure the right to development. I therefore crafted my title Sir Arthur Lewis and Racism, Growing Inequality and the Right to Development, Destruction of Civilization. Because it is only if we uproot the constantly peddled version of civilization and development that we will be able to genuinely advance, that we will be able to reclaim our humanity. It is almost two centuries after the abolition of enslavement 11 years from now, there is still a portioning of development. Then we cannot continue to support a system where we were the first cargo and where there is a re-emerging movement to re-commodify us. We cannot continue to accept a civilization where our current commodities are enchained by a global system that relegates them to a status that keeps us impoverished and underdeveloped. We cannot continue to accept a civilization which tells us that all other races are entitled to payment for their oppression, but that we are not human enough to merit the same treatment. That we must accept hollow, empty apologies and not ask for the Understa the understanding and the back pay of our forefathers. That we accept the status quo and fit our lives in its stead. 
This is the reason I wanted to speak about the right to development and not necessarily the development advocated by the current UN and global configurations. We are not asking for simple reform. We want fundamental change. As we also celebrate this month, the 1804 victory of the Haitian Revolution, almost 222 years ago, I affirm, like Toussaint Louverture, declared in a letter to the French General Assembly, and I quote, for too long we have borne your chains without thinking of shaking them off. But any authority which is not founded on virtue and humanity, and which only tends to subject one's fellow man to slavery, must come to an end, and that end is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, it's not my first presentation of the Sir Arthur Lewis Nobel Laureate Lecture. And each time I have tried to bring an understanding, not just to his scholarly and academic work, but to give further insights into the person and the context of his deliberations. On this occasion, I want to say that I think I am finally understanding what drove his thinking. No, I am not an economist as you will hear, and so you will hear nothing about models of development, or dual economies, or variants. But somewhere in the presentation, I will say something about equilibrium and distribution, as they speak to the issues of racism and equality, which are central themes of the presentation. Really, I want to deepen your understanding of an innovative and forward-thinking, yet rational mind of a social scientist a quiet revolutionary, and hope that I am invited back in a few years because, this, because his complexities can never be explored in our brief encounter tonight. Fundamentally, Sir Arthur Lewis was so much more than an economist. By relegating this multi-dimensional intellect to being only an economist, and I, I am not apologizing to the economists in the room, we have denied him accessibility. I hope that you can access this brilliant, the mind of this brilliant solution, son. Arthur Lewis spent his entire life attempting to provide strategic and innovative solutions to structural post-colonial inequalities and racism to ensure the right to development. In a previous presentation entitled Regional Integration and Constitutional Reform, Perspectives of Sir Arthur Lewis, I posited that he, and I quote, argued against the dominance of the white land-owning planter class over the landless laborers, as it reduced the sense of dignity and independence of those workers, unquote. Further, that the racist civilizing of the newly freed black population did not engender equitable societies. In 1980, Lewis inquired, quote, why do the people with the power use it against the ones without power, unquote. He replied, you know, it's a good thing when you have a conversation with yourself, when you're an intelligent person. He replied, on economic grounds, the sensible thing to do is to invest in the poor, not to kill them. We have always assumed that it would pay the rich to exploit the poor. We've always assumed that slavery paid. I'm sorry, but slavery doesn't pay. Instead, he viewed both racism and inequalities and their systematic exploitation as an assault on human rights and urge that those who saw it, quote, should talk about it. So I'm speaking tonight. In his lecture entitled, Sir Arthur Lewis, in, the in his lecture entitled, Sir Arthur Lewis and Development Economics, 50 years on, Gerald M. Meyer states that Lewis concluded that the problem with development was, we failed to do enough to improve the conditions of the poor. He added that Lewis contended, we know pretty well, but not completely, what needs to be done 
to eliminate absolute poverty. The diet is a mixture of land, jobs, and social services. Minister, you're hearing. What lacks is the will, the will of governments to proceed. The development economy, economist was clear that, and I quote, it is as important to expand social services as it is to produce more commodities. Neither has priority over each other, unquote. He would reiterate in 1967 in his paper on planning public expenditure that, and I quote, commodities and services have no advantage over each other, both yield utility. Yet we continue to see the provision of these services as a drain on the public purse, rather than a means of raising the dignity of citizens of the region. Six years after he wrote about power and poverty, in 1986, the United Nations in Resolution 41-128 announced the Declaration on the Right to Development, and considered in its preamble that, and I quote, situations such as those resulting from colonialism, neo-colonialism, apartheid, all forms of racism and racial discrimination, foreign domination and occupation, aggression and threats against national sovereignty, national unity and territorial integrity, and threats of war contribute to the establishment of circumstances unfavorable to the development of a great part of mankind. You can see ourselves somewhere there, right? Arthur Lewis and a crowd of Caribbean and African intellectuals had already articulated these centuries of systematic oppression were designed to forever keep us subjugated. Ladies and gentlemen, the occupation of Africa must end for us to build our civilization. If they will not end it, we must end this tyranny by our own configurations. The sophistication of the strategic opportunities proposed by Lewis, including the development of new forms of regional cooperation, was based on the recognition that a diverse region like this had all the human, social, cultural, and emotional attributes to advance and develop. A similar reasoning would be made by Errol Barrow when he defined us as a Caribbean civilization. Lewis's views on integration were part of his philosophy of Pan-Africanism. Ola Opoyemi in Pan-Africanism, an ideology of development, writes that this solidarity of the oppressed was in the view of Garvey and Nkrumah, integration would be the only basis of real power in black Africa, the lasting basis of emancipation. Lewis would go on to devote much of his time on articulating the need for integration, but much more of his energies on the right to development. He contends that we needed to do it as a region, hence his disappointment in the failure of the Federation, as expressed in the agony of the eight. As a regional integrationist, my own view is that we had to break down the colonial template of Federation before we could rebuild our own unity. This presentation proposes that to address and narrow the inequalities the Caribbean construct must refrain from defining its relationship only by collaboration on technical and developmental projects, but must reflect a manifestation of a much deeper connection based on human rights of the Caribbean man and woman. It is as a vulnerable region that the Caribbean must mobilize and rationalize all the resources at its disposal to counter the negative impact of a myriad of racial and inequality challenges on the people, on the environmental sanctity, on socioeconomic growth and stability. Resilience, renewal, and sustainability must therefore also be expressed as core to the unity and development of the region. 
Let me then set the context for the work of this simple, humble, everyday individual who never wore his achievements on his sleeve. He was a young man, approximately 18 years old, when he made his sojourn into a colonial racist country, not unlike the one he had left behind in St. Lucia. It was the 1930s, a time of poverty for most of the population, a time when the workers of the region declared that they would no longer live in the deprivation of the post-slavery period, and they wanted a fair wage for a fair day's work. In England, he witnessed the expansion of the black population after the war, and also the wave of West Indian immigrants escaping the poverty of the Caribbean. He therefore had first-hand experience of the discrimination, poverty, and exploitation of such persons. The exclusion and racism at the time dictated that Lewis would, could not study to become an engineer because the prospects for black people in that profession were non-existent. His victory would come in the study of economics, and he would hone his craft in the area of development economics a new endeavor focused on newly emerging nations. Much of his theoretical work in the late 1940s and early 1950s were therefore fueled by his sometimes outspoken anger over, and I quote, the disparity between the rich and the poor and its strong overlap with the disparity between black and white, unquote. Mosley and Ingram write that, in the midst of constructing the model, he was at the same time campaigning to improve living standards and attack racial discrimination amongst the Afro-Caribbean community of the city of Manchester, where he worked. Throughout the paper, they pointed out how Lewis used his influence at the colonial office to try to improve the lives of immigrants whether it was through the establishment of community centers that would assist with further education, assisting them with the partner or the susu. You all know susu, right? Louis took it to Manchester. And in an attempt to save money and get the down payment for homes or working with friendly societies, such as the Negro Association, the Colored Seamen and Industrial League, the Igbo Union, the Gold Coast Brotherhood, the Crow Friendly Society, the West Indian Friendly Society, and the African Students' Union. He understood the exclusion he would write about when he later examined the situation of African Americans and offered practical solutions fitting for the time, even when he was criticized for not going far enough. It would inform his understanding of the role of industrialization for developing countries. Understanding that the only way to deal with the poverty that plagued these countries and crippled the agricultural sector, causing high rates of unemployment, could only be addressed by the value added that industrialization would bring. The colonial government never saw industrialization as part of our development plan. According to EBA Censor on Lewis's theory of growth and development, Lewis was critical of colonial governments between 1880 to 1913 and names them as poor or mediocre. He states that, and I quote, none were good in the sense of giving high priority to development. Today, they destroy all our attempts at diversification. We are perpetually on white lists that insist on telling us that we are corrupt and can only manage financial services under the table as if corruption has a black face. Yet you see what is happening in the countries where no penalties are applied. We are defining the global market as only primary producers. I am tempted to say like Bob Marley, total destruction, the only solution but I hold my bravado in check. Terence Farrell in his article, Arthur Lewis and the Case for Caribbean Industrialization, notes the arguments proposed by many British officials against industrialization of the West Indies as are well documented. 
He asserts that in the organization of the empire, I quote, the colonies were relegated to the role of suppliers of raw materials, whilst the metropole was the source of manufactured consumer capital goods, unquote. In today's parlance, these gangsters had cornered the manufacturing market and secured for themselves ensured or enforced closure thereby ensuring strife in the re region. Strife that resulted in the labor riots and strife which ensured the emergence of prophets like Marcus Garvey, who had demanded that, and I quote, the white, yellow, and brown races give to the black man his place in the civilization of the world, unquote. His evangelism had offered solutions for regaining the humanity of the black race, and his message for development resonated throughout the world. This was the context in which Lewis developed his theories. He was aptly, call, aptly called the father of development economics because no economist before him explored the question of our progress as people as humans who had a right to development. His contribution was not only to economics, but to a deeper understanding of the need to raise the humanity of an oppressed people through development. He recognized that the needs of underdeveloped countries were virtually unlimited. And he set out to prove that we had the capacity for uplifting ourselves by our bootstraps. If, as CLR James stated, they would get off our backs. Long before George Floyd, we recognized that we could not breathe. We will recall that Lewis considered himself a social democrat and was a member of the Pan-African Bureau. When Ghana became independent in 1957, the government made Lewis its first economic advisor, and he helped to draw, upon the, to draw up the first five-year development plan as advisor to President Kwame Nkrumah. He also served as an economic advisor to numerous African, Asian, and Caribbean governments, namely Nigeria, Ghana, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and Barbados. Like most early Pan-Africanists, Lewis embraced the two philosophies of liberation and integration. Yet, even as an anti-imperialist, his recommended solutions were realistic and empirical. According to Tete Coffey, Lewis made his contribution by ensuring that there was, and I quote, programming development strategies in the colonial and post-colonial eras. With regard to the criticism from the New World Group that his strategies did not go far enough, Kofi noted that, I quote, ours, and Kofi was part of the New World Group, ours, however, would have been an unrealistic strategy under the colonial setting. Lewis's strategy of colonial industrialization was based more on empirical and rational considerations than on the theory of anti-imperialism alone. As I noted in a previous lecture, Sir Arthur, was a practical laureate. As a development economist, he dedicated much time to thinking of ways in which development could be secured by the population of those former colonies. He considered that, I quote, economic growth creates disturbing tensions in the society, which can be resolved only if the increased output is used to secure more equitable distribution, unquote. I used to have that argument with my brother all the time. He's an economist. See, distribution must be at the center of development. It cannot remain where it is. He was advocating for an active closing of the gap between the rich and the poor. Ladies and gentlemen, trickle down does not work. Stiglitz refers to it as an old myth. We have to stop buying the repackaging of these betis that the rich will create jobs. Where, where is the investment from those who have become richer 
by the growing global inequality. The fact is that our lack of opportunity is ever present, even in the face of economic growth. Those who will never, they will never, sorry, easily share or give it up to those who do not have. In the post-colonial period, the haves and the have-nots were clearly demarcated along color lines. According to Hilborn Watson, and I quote, all whites benefit from the historically ascribed privilege of whiteness, whether or not they endorse or practice white supremacy. Although Lewis may not have articulated it in the same manner, he made it clear, I quote, the interest of creating a healthy society with tensions and injustices, injustices moderated and limited requires that welfare be given equal priority with growth right from the beginning. Minister, I'm writing your policy papers. We spend so much time thinking of GDP, we forget Arthur Lewis's clear prescription that, and I quote, more savings and more growth are desirable, but not at the expense of social and welfare services. I remember these words when I walk the streets of Castries and see the growing number of destitute aged people and witness the hospices of the William Peter Boulevard and the Constitution Park. Distribution has clearly not been on our mind. Let me borrow from Stiglitz again and say that the price of inequality is too high. In our countries, income, race, and educational attainment are inextricably linked. Lewis lamented that the, and I quote, British Caribbean, apart from Barbados and Trinidad, spent too little on education, and noted the African philosophy that, and I quote, until all have literacy, none shall have anything more, unquote. For Lewis, education provided opportunities for mobility and the ability to move into jobs previously occupied by colonial professionals and public servants. He also spoke to the relevance of the curriculum. He writes, and I quote, in adapting any syllabus for us in a poor country, one has to decide how much of the factual framework taught elsewhere can be scrapped in favor of local conditions and how much can be retained, unquote. So he advanced, for example, that a medical student in the tropics should have or should know about tropical diseases. Very clear. In her presentation of the Sir Arthur Lewis Lecture in 2021, Aldrey Henry Lee contends that, and I quote, by and large, the current system of education throughout the Caribbean is inextricably linked to colonialism. Unquote. We need an overhaul of an education system that makes our young people failures at 11 and leaves us to wonder why our youth are disillusioned and antisocial. Lewis also observed that black Americans were not getting their fair share of the jobs. And he, I quote, due partly to deficiencies in education and partly to discrimination, with the education deficiencies being largely due to discrimination, unquote. And added that, I quote again, I spent a lot of time reading Lewis, as you can see. It is, ne I'm a fan girl. It is necessary to get rid of racial discrimination in jobs if the educational picture is to come right. Discrimination was hampering both educational attainment and access to jobs. But he still advanced or advocated remaining within the system in an attempt to change it from inside. While Lewis had spent much of his life in black power movements in countries where the objective of the political movement was to capture the central legislature and the executive and judicial powers. These countries were mainly in the Caribbean and in Africa, where blacks were in the majority, 
and wanted control of their nations. In the US, the case was different, and he dedicated much time writing on solutions available to them. At the time, African Americans were only 11% of the population. Today, they comprise approximately 13 to 14%. In the economic profile of the American black, written in 1970, Arthur Lewis concludes that, and I quote, we are not going to solve the economic problems without a bitter struggle, especially to get the black population its proper share of middle and upper jobs. But it took a bitter struggle to win our legal rights, and I have no doubt that similar perseverance will also win our economic rights." Unquote. I believe that this statement should be considered alongside the critic by C.L.R. James in his lecture entitled The Making of the Caribbean People, delivered in 1966. James notes that Lewis's statement that, and I quote, what is required is the effort and readiness to sacrifice by the great part of the population. People don't know whether the population, the West Indian population, will make the effort or not. Ask yourself that question, are we making the effort or not? James disassociated himself from this perceived hesitancy by stating that, and I quote, I have never found that West Indians, when called upon in a critical situation, do not respond, unquote. James added, I strongly remove myself from the view expressed by Professor Lewis that it depends on us whether we shall rise to the occasion. And that's where the quote about the backs come in. If those on our backs get off our backs, we will be able to rise. This critique by James has been used many times to depict, to depict Lewis as faint-hearted as opposed to a more revolutionary and radical CLR James. Perhaps a more Creole phrase would have more clearly assisted Lewis's cause, and I propose replacing the word struggle with bataille, or goume, or even laje, to demonstrate the depth of our battle for development. My own opinion is not centered on which point of view is right, but to see the merit in both judgments. Both luminaries recognize that to build our resilience, we had to gume. However, there is a clear warning from both that we should not grow weary if we are to achieve sustainable development. Both recognize the limitations placed on our efforts by system, systemic racism and inequality, whether we call it a struggle or a bataille. In Black Power and the American University, Lewis writes, and I quote, rising from the bottom to the middle or the top in the face of stiff white competition, prejudice and arbitrary barriers takes everything a man can give to it, unquote. He saw this as the yardstick by which we were winning the battle. He added that, and I quote, the African American could not make it to the top so long as he was e effectively excluded from this small number of select institutions. Here, is re here he is referring to universities or degree granting institutions. He postulated that, and I quote, the breakthrough of the African American into these colleges is thereby absolutely fundamental to the larger economic strategy of black power reiterating the prognosis that education was essential for development. He encouraged African Americans to strive to get to the top in the white universities and to do the subjects that would get them into top professions, recognizing that this is not just a matter of schooling. The barriers of prejudice which keep us off the ladder still have to be broken down. Stressing that, and I quote, we need to raise our own sights to recognize that there are more opportunities than there were and to take every opportunity that is offered, unquote. He did not agree that African Americans should only go to black colleges 
as he saw the integration in universities as assisting in reducing the tension between the races. At the height of the black power movement, he advocated that, and I quote, if black Americans are looking to Africa for aspects of culture, that will diminish them, this, sorry, that will distinguish them from white Americans, let them turn their backs on Spockism and rear their children on African principles, for this is the way to the middle and the top. Here he's speaking to the indisciplined and uncontrolled child wearing proposed by Dr. Spock, as opposed to the highly disciplined structures of the African family and the values of the African village. The village raising the child is an African understanding. In the economic profile of the American black, Lewis tackled the issue of segregation and integration in the United States, recognizing that investment in the black communities was important to the development of African Americans. He, however, added that, and I quote, while the development of black capitalism in the ghettos and outside is a very useful part of black economic strategy, much more important at this time is to try to remove the barriers that are keeping blacks at the bottom of white organizations in which most of them have to work. Yet in the economics of racial inequality, written in 1985, he would tackle the issue of inequality and the earnings of white versus black workers and the inequality of the situation. Lewis defines equality as a situation where the medians and the quartiles are the same in relation to earnings. So that if the median for white workers is $100,000, then it should be the same for black workers and the quartile should also be the same. It should therefore be a 50-50 condition. Unfortunately, when he wrote this article in 1985, only 31% as opposed to 50% of blacks who were at that median. This translated into a deficit of 19%, which further translated into 100 million jobs not being available to the black man. The gap for black women was the same, but Lewis concludes that, and I quote, this is mainly because they are women and not primarily because they are black. But I am not going there tonight. <laughs> Gender is not my primary focus. I would take off on a tangent and speak about the role of the black woman in the black community and the multiplier effect of her earnings, but I am not going there tonight. Just to say who feels it knows it. The fact is that there is a gap that needed to be addressed. And Lewis notes that how long it takes to dwindle will depend on both the prosperity of the country and I quote, how rapidly or slowly discrimination is eroded. In a situation compounded by hiring practices and restricted advancement in companies, it is clear that the labor market breeds inequality and the right to development is therefore stifled by discrimination and the inequality which it perpetuates. Lewis therefore contends that, in, and I quote, in a race between two groups, the dominant group has the advantage and inequality increases. The majority group will go ahead absolutely, but will fall behind relatively, unquote. Dealing with the need for reparations, Earl would not forgive me if I didn't say that, Lewis raises the question that many have asked. How much? What determines the basis of calculation? By whom? To whom? He proposes, and I quote, the answer this, to this kind of question are found not in economics, but in law and philosophy. Yet he recognized that, and I quote, grants from the imperial treasury should be accorded if we are to see in the, near, in the near future any noticeable improvement in the West Indies condition. Lewis also speaks to the issue of affirmative action as part of reparations for the past and to prevent abuses in the future. A way of leveling the playing field, we in the reparations movement are ready to make the legal case. Right, Levy? 
the right to development and the destruction of civilization. At the end of this year in December 2023, we will be celebrating the 37th anniversary of the UN General Assembly Resolution that I mentioned earlier, 41-128, Declaration on the Right to Development. This human rights instrument recognizes in its preamble that development is a comprehensive economic, social, cultural, and political process which aims at the constant improvement of the well-being of the entire population and of all individuals on the basis of their active, free, and meaningful participation in development and in the fair distribution of benefits resulting therefrom. You all have no idea how happy I am to see the issue of distribution tackled at all levels. Participation is necessary. The removal of exclusion is essential and distribution is central. According to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, I quote, the goal of development is to improve the well-being of every member of society. People are not the how of development not tools that can be exploited to produce greater wealth for limited elites. They are the why. True development generates greater social justice, not deeper exploitation, and it reduces the towering inequalities which threaten fundamental human rights, in particular of those who are marginalized and poor. While the eloquence of the High Commissioner is beyond reproach, the reality is that, as previously noted, those who have power will never concede it without a fight. We need a destruction of the current power relations, and we need to do that with some urgency. The 1% cannot continue to hold us to ransom. The UN's as Secretary General proposes the following elements to be part of the concept of development. The realization of the potential of the human person in harmony with the community should be seen as the central purpose of development. The human person should be regarded as the subject and not the object of the development process. Development requires the satisfaction of both material and non-material basic needs. Respect for human rights is fundamental to the development process. The human person must be able to participate fully in shaping his or own reality. Respect for the principles of equality and non-discrimination is essential. And the achievement of a degree of individual and collective self-reliance must be an integral part of the process. We have had to battle to be considered persons. We in the Caribbean have put human rights on the agenda. Let us fight for the implementation of that agenda. We cannot detach Lewis's economic thoughts from the colonial context which ensured that the empire relegated us to generational poverty. We have always had to break down so that we can rebuild because of the systemic and institutional racism that has told us that we cannot rise above the limitations they have imposed. The quiet revolutionary in 1973 went as far as recommending disruptions and making life uncomfortable. I'm telling you I was surprised when I saw that. And making life uncomfortable for those who, I quote, live as islands of wealth in a sea of poverty. See, he was also a poet. I take it one step further and ask, when will that civilization be reconstructed? I deliberately left the destruction of civilization for my final section because I wanted to channel Arthur Lewis by leaning heavily on that semantic giant of black Stalin, who is now at the gate of St. Peter, waiting to bond them. <laughs> well, I have some recommendations for black Stalin as we consider those who keep workers oppressed by, perpetu by perpetuating inequality, as Sir Arthur states, by keeping down entry into the labor market 
by keeping us divided and keeping inequality alive. Should I repeat it? Burn them? How about those who stifle our attempt at diversifying and building new industries and keeping us at the bottom of the food chain? You are free to say burn them. Those who resist all attempts at restructuring global institutions that keep developing countries burdened with debt. Those who refuse to accept the need for climate justice. Those who manage a banking system that imposes penalties on the poor while protecting those who can afford to circumvent the, all of the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, how can we disrupt the current civilization built on inequality, racism, and strife to recreate our own civilization? <laughs> Carrie, <laughs> Carrie um, Polani Levitt, who delivered the, 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 the ECCB Sir Arthur Lewis lecture in 2000, states that Sir, Sir Arthur entitled Sir Arthur on the right to development. So this is not the first time you're hearing the right to development. Um, states or reminds us that the right to development, I quote, the right to development has been subordinated to the rights of investors, fortified by the trade enforceable regime of the World Trade Organization, and an ever-growing list of economic and political conditionalities attached to official development finance, unquote. Levitz had been very familiar with Lewis, having met him in 1942 as an undergraduate student. And in that lecture, expertly handles the economic side of development. I hope that this presentation tonight adds dimensions to what she noted as, and I quote, gross inequalities, deep cleavages of class and race, and a malfunctioning of a political system. She calls for a reclaiming of the right to development. I posit that we never were supposed to have the right to development because of our history. But like her, I concur with Arthur Lewis that we have everything within us, everything that we need to develop, if only they would get off our backs. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, let me say, like Robert Tigner in the W. Arthur Lewis papers, I quote, Lewis was not just a scholar. He was a true public intellectual and endeavored to use his training in economic development to support the economies of decolonizing countries, unquote. He held strong views on the lifting up of people from developing countries but never apart from the world that existed. His views on integration and living in a harmony with all races meant he was simply a man of his time, but that did not hinder his anti-imperialist views. He simply wanted racial, social, economic, equality, and justice. Maybe he was an idealist after all. I thank you. burn them. But let's be careful when we're burning them. Um, the main sponsor, I repeat, is Bank of St. Lucia. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Suba, for the wonderful lecture that you provided. Um, let me just acknowledge the presence of the representative group of the South CC Debate Society who are with us right now. Thank you. Um, one, one thing that, that, that I, I do note from that lecture is that Sir Arthur Lewis was a practical laureate and it, and it, it really transcends in his work. And of course, a lot of times when we speak of regional integration um, and any union, we speak about strength in numbers. And one thing that resonates with me is that it is not just strength in numbers but what
builds up that strength. So many times they speak of an economic union and the power of the integration, but however, the, the fight of human rights, if us as, as a Caribbean could come together with the fight of human rights and equality, just imagine the integration that we could have across the region. So at this point in time, we will be entertaining questions from the audience and also our viewership online. Um, I will start off with a quick question for our esteemed lecturer. Some, some persons argue that the distribution of wealth takes place or it takes precedence over the economic means to ascertain said wealth. How would that wealth be ascertained for you to distribute or redistribute that wealth? So that means that the economic or the economic means should take precedence over the distribution of wealth. What would be your response to that? Thank you for the question. Can I um, say that Arthur Lewis didn't see either as taking precedence over the other? He saw them as working hand in hand. Um, one of the things that has always interested me, or one of the questions I've always asked myself, um, what level of economic growth is necessary to alleviate poverty? There, were, there was a time when St. Lucia had 6% economic growth and there was so much poverty. There is a time, well, these days we're in zero, I think. Zero economic growth. So, you can, so as I said, the hospices are growing down on the William Peter Boulevard and, and, and so on. So we don't, we're not seeing the kind of economic growth because of the kind of development we have pursued. And that is why I'm asking for us to turn it over on its head. It has not served us. It has just reinforced inequalities. So those who have continued to benefit from the system of inequality and the rest continue to get poor. And then you say to people, lift yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, some people don't even have boots. That's true. You understand? And, and, and so, the, 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 um, like Sir Arthur, I am one of the people who believe there must be some active social welfare program. I don't know why social welfare gets a bad name. I don't know why it gets a bad name. But there are some people who need help. There are some people who need help. I can tell you that I would not be here if it was not for assistance that my mother received when we were growing up. We were all poor, and it took education to bring us to this level. You never heard the name Suma before that, you know? So it is necessary for us to have active programs that will help people out of their poverty. I know why in the United States it has such a bad name, because the image is that it is only black people who are on social welfare, and the numbers show the opposite. The opposite. So they're saying, okay, these black people refuse to work, and so they just want to, to, to be parasites on the society. Not so. How much harder do we have to work? How much harder? We, uh, some, of, some of our people have two, three, four, five jobs, and they are still poor. How much harder do you want them to work? I am saying there must be a system actively pursued by the government minister to be able to help people to lift themselves out of poverty. You do not, it's not something that will be, that you can sustain forever. The sustainability is a question, but I think that there are other ways that we can do it. We cannot continue in a system that tells us that we must just be primary producers. And I am telling you, that is what they want us to be. I, I, I now live uh, temporarily, because I'm, I want to come home, um, in the Virgin Islands. And I'm writing the National Sustainable Development Plan. 
in a country that is still colonial. It is an overseas territory. But it has one of the biggest financial services um, industries in the world. And there is a little um, pickaxe that they're chipping away. The British government is chipping away at it because the country should not be developing at the pace that it is developing. It is a colonial black country. We need to get rid of colonialism in the entire region. It is time for us who are independent, and I'm saying this publicly, to help those people who are still overseas territories of colonial countries to reach their level of freedom. Our independence cannot be achieved when there are so many amongst us who are not independent. I'm not holding back my bravado this time. I'm glad that you don't. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and the dear minister, put people first. <laughs> yes. yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point in time, we'll take questions from the audience. I see we have one question to the bank, please. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for your presentation. You alluded earlier on to the inequalities in education, and I want you to speak a little bit to that. Because we, we as an academic institution at Sa'atha, we always look at the requirements for students to matriculate. And of course, if you don't have mathematics, if you don't have this, if you don't have that, then at your level of education, you know, you can't matriculate into the college. But speak to me a little bit more about the common entrance. Now the name has changed to the CPEA, but it is the same thing. In terms of at the age of 11, 12, you write this exam, and if you don't do as well as you could have done on the day or the two days it is now, and they've changed it slightly to include 40% over the one year, et cetera, et cetera. But the discrimination and the inequality still exist. So I would like for you to speak a little bit about that and why it is we continue this system which cripples our young people from early. Thank you. Okay, um, so Arthur Lewis believed in standards. And he did not believe in lowering standards for the education system. And so I also agree that we must have standards. But how we set the standards and the context in which we set the standards is very important. So we have built schools. We have school buildings. We do not have enough trained teachers. We do not have enough resources. I have a niece who is a teacher, and she uses her to purchase resources for her class. And I did that when I was a teacher also. So you have children who come to school hungry. A building cannot give you access when you're hungry. You know how many times I had to stand up and prepare sandwiches before I went to school so that children could be fed? and you expect them to go into an exam and do very well and succeed and move on to a secondary school where, you, where there is further re refinement. We are creating a situation where you are creaming off some people and everybody else is left behind. We cannot continue to perpetuate inequality in our systems. And I think that it is time for us to look at how we can over, overhaul our education system, remove, and we keep saying we are, we, are, we, are, we are doing it, we have curriculum reform, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what are we reforming? A tweak here, a tweak there. You know, nobody wants to change it because that is what we are comfortable with. We have to move out of our comfort zone. We have enough secondary schools in St. Lucia, for every child to attend secondary school. What we have to do is to think about remedial education differently. We need to think about remedial education differently. So, a child gets to form one, and when I was in, um, when I lived in St. Kitts, I did a presentation once to the teachers about boys and marginalization. And when I did the research, I realized by third form that boys were dropping out of school because they were not interested in the academic subjects that they were being taught. 
What about bringing the community into the school? So the boys would leave and go by the mechanic to help him to change tires. Why don't you bring the mechanic in to show him the children how to change tires or how to change the oil and, and these things? How come we have edu How, why, why? Why do we have education on the periphery of society? Our education system is not integrated into the society and so it is irrelevant. It is irrelevant. And so we have to start looking at relevance and what we can do in that regard. So all the businesses in town complain that Sir Arthur Lewis graduates a number of students every year, but they don't have any place for them in their businesses because these children are not ready for work. How are we preparing children for work? Or how are we preparing children to be entrepreneurs and business people? How are we doing that? We continue with a system that is going to continue to fail us. That's, that's how I see it. Those of us who make, made it, made it because of a number of other reasons. For my mother, education, food and clothes were the only thing she could afford to give you. So for, for, for many of us, that's what it was. You know, when parents can afford, cannot afford to give you any of these things, how are you going to be successful in a situation like this? When there is also a pull, so the education system is pushing them, and there is a pull from all of the unsavory things that we don't want to see in the society. It's more attractive to them because it makes them feel as if they belong. The education system alienates our children. It's okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions from the I want to audience? make a comment, if I know. Go right ahead, sir. Um, I think the problem is in the Sumer family. <laughs> Thank you. One of the most significant things that I drew from your talk was the, the, when you said that you had a problem with your brother <laughs> in terms of the rationalization or the direction in which development should move, right? And you talk about education. And his education, which is very good from a particular point of view, but he has not been able to relate the education, and you find that among a lot of the economists that we have here, in relation to the social conditions as they exist. And that was the difference between, that is the, 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 the beauty about Sir Arthur, that he was able to integrate not only economics but the social aspects. So the problem lies in the, not only in the education system locally, but what some people go out and they, you know, get the first world education, but are not able to relate uh, what they have learned in relation to our own development. It is obvious that the capitalist system does not work, this question of going, uh, getting the crumbs. And it has been proved in St. Lucia, you talked about the, the question of the growth, right? And we are not study, we have to study what has happened before. What we are enjoying today in St. Lucia was brought about not from the top coming down, but from the bottom going up. And that was in relation to what you talked about, the distribution of the resources. What happened was that you had firm distribution, fairly even distribution throughout the country through the small farmers who were growing their bananas. 
And when they got the money every week, which is the, the, the flow, the cash flow, were able to go to the next shop, the village shop, okay? And the village shop, in turn, has to get the goods from the guys in castries who do the wholesaling, etc. So the money was flowing not from the top down, but what I call, I describe it as capillarity. It was moving up into the society. So it was the bottom small farmers who were contributing significantly to the growth and development of the country. So we have a very good example of what truly happened when you really analyze the situation. It wasn't from the top going down. It was from the bottom going up. And it was reflected in the standard of living. For example, when you go down to Iriso, La Puente, and so on, the quality of the houses, and they were able to educate their children. And so, the flow was from the bottom up, and that is the way we should structure our development. We have that particular lesson to look at and study it carefully, and see how you could apply that same principle in relation to the new tourist-oriented industry that we have now, the dominant um, thing. Uh, I think that the government is in going in the right direction in that way, particularly as it relates to getting the tourism development from the bottom up, you know, the, uh, what you call the village tourism and so on and so forth. So you need to convince your uh, brother and his associates, those who still think that way, to shift the direction according to what Sir Arthur really believed in. Thank you. Um, let me tell you that like Sir Arthur, my brother grew into the concept and was responsible to a large extent for the village tourism pro programs that you see going on. He was the one who introduced some of them and brought the projects. So he has come a long way, Mr. George. <laughs> but, um, so the problem is not the so We find solutions. Um, the, the, the challenge for us was um, after the decline of bananas was how to maintain the middle class. How to maintain a middle class. The structures that our middle class um, was built on, the structures were collapsing around us. And you started to see us moving two steps backward. Um, to a lot, I, I, I don't know a lot about the tourist industry. I know more about agriculture. But I can say that our country has made attempts at diversification, which is one of the things that Sir Arthur um, wrote about. You cannot depend only on agriculture. Our agriculture is still at the level of primary production and um, the value added that people like you had started um, when you were there in the Ministry of Agriculture, we don't see it anymore. The things that we produced at, you know, and manufactured, we don't see it anymore. Sometimes not because of our own doing. I remember growing up as a child and visiting copra factories and so on. And then there was this big... Um, campaign against coconut oil. And it destroyed our industry, the value added that we had invested in. And then all of a sudden, right now, coconut oil is the best thing under the sun. You know? And so, 
I say that to say that our attempts at diversify, diversifying, at industrialization, as Arthur Lewis saw it, the value added, has always been dismantled by somebody else. We had started the financial services industry in St. Lucia also. I remember being at the central bank and St. Lucia was doing very well in financial services. And all of a sudden you heard nothing about it. You heard nothing about it because we are on some white lists that say that we are corrupt. You know, and so we have to look at how these things systematically um, keep us impoverished. We have to look at the systems. Total destruction, the only solution. <laughs> um, There's somebody there who really likes Bundem. <laughs> I think we all do. So um, our next question will come from Dr. Henry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I wanted to start with the, the freeze, burn them. <laughs> um, because, and perhaps I should say first, thank you very much for a um, very enlightening presentation. And you say you're not an economist, but I, I thought, as a development economist myself, I thought, uh, you, you're right on the money in terms of, of um, some of the articulations and so forth that came out of your presentation. How do we burn them? How do we fight? I, I like that phrase. I was leaving that to St. Peter and Black okay. Stalin. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I like that, that reference to fighting for development. You've had 40 years plus, four decades, of post-independence, independence experience for us and throughout several of the Caribbean countries. And, and I agree with Sir Calix George that in the 80s, we grew at 5%. In the 90s, we began slowing down world trade organization, trade liberalization, all of those came through. In the early 2000s, we started recovering, tourism came out, but tourism has not brought the kind of growth that bananas brought. And then you had the 2008 financial crisis. Brought growth, well, pretty much tepid growth, no growth, tepid growth. And then when you thought you out of it, you had COVID. And constantly throughout the 40 years or so, we've been fighting for development. And we seem to be losing the battle. So the question really is, how do we now win the battle? Because if you look forward, and you're right, the conditions, the social conditions, the economic conditions continue to worsen. You have a new generation, what do you call them, Generation Z? You know, I was having a conversation in terms of who, you know, because I'm not sure I, where I stand. I think that. I know, I'm in the older building. generation. <laughs> Gen generation Z, or whatever they call them now, or X. And the question is, how would we move in a post-COVID development environment where we can win the battle in development? Because we have to turn the clock with, in terms of the trajectory of economic growth, we have to grow faster. We have to turn the clock where it comes to the economic diversification issues. We cannot survive on tourism alone. We have to diversify. We have to create economic environments that that have like like an octopus with, you know, that can take everyone, you know, with different skills, um, with different training, different capabilities. How do we do so? How do we win the battle and development in the post-COVID? I'm not sure if we're still we now in post-COVID, but in the post-COVID environment where we have been losing over the last 40 years that battle for development. So that's, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's your question. I thought you were, you were about to give me a solution. Um, the only thing I can say is that we did not use the opportunity that COVID gave to us to change the system. We have been so busy trying to get back to normal. We never realized that normal really suited us. 
And so, as a non-economist, <laughs> you are the development economist. Um, I have to, to worry. I am worried about the next generation. I'm worried. Um, I'm worried for the country, you know. Um, not worried just because we have m more murders, but I'm worried about something that we heard about in the Derek Walcott lecture. I'm worried that we are losing our value system. And um, I think that we have to find a way of recapturing that. Um, I don't know that the churches can do it for us. I don't know that the schools can do it for us. I don't know that the parents can do it for us. I think it will take all of us. Because we usually point the finger and say, oh, the church is not doing enough. Or oh, it's bad parenting, you know. It will take all of us and everything we can do to, um, to bring our country back, but not bring it back to what it was, to ensure that we create a space for everybody. We have to create the space for everybody. It is because people are feeling marginalized why they are acting up. They are acting up because they don't feel that they belong to the society that currently exists. I don't know that I have any answers for you. I don't. I just think that we have to try and do it together. That, that was a brilliant answer, by the way. <laughs> we have a question from one of our students from the South Lewis Community College. Good evening, Dr. Suma. Do you think Sir Arthur Lewis, as a Pan-African, an advocate for empowerment of Caribbean people, may have ever regretted implementing industrialization by invitation as one of the major results was the further, the further exploitation of our people. I hate to tell you that this is a, mis, um, a misinterpretation of Sir Arthur's mm -hmm. model. How so? He wrote about industrialization not industrial, he used an example of Puerto Rico, where there was development because of invitation, um, you know, people, investors came in to Puerto Rico. And everybody, I mean, he's, he's given, he's given um, credit for something he never wrote. He wrote about industrialization and the need for us to have an economy, a value-added economy then. But he never wrote about industrialization by invitation. Some other group took up what he said and dubbed it industrialization by invitation. So I don't think that Sir Arthur has any regrets about it. In fact, <laughs> Sir Arthur Lewis had a very good sense of humor. You know, there's a, a quotation, I think Dave knows it better than me, where he says um, that since his thesis um, and his theory that 50 books have been written, a hundred and something articles have been written and so on. And they're still writing. They're still writing. And nobody has written what he has said. Nobody wrote what he said. And so I, I, I recommend that you go back and look at it. Do like me. I like primary sources. I like primary sources. So I go into the library and I read his own writings, just about everything that I said here tonight um, reflected the words written by Arthur Lewis. Read what he said himself about industrialization and you will see that it was not anything about industrialization by invitation. So I don't think he had any regrets about it. You know, one of the wonderful things about people like Arthur Lewis and then Derek Walcott is that they, they put pen to paper you know, it's easy to criticize when you have not written anything yourself. Word to the wise. That's I think right. That's yeah, but we have one question to the right side of the room, and then we go to the left side, and we have the disciple of 
Walcott and Lewis. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Suma, for your really wonderful um, lecture on a certain talk show, a certain um, individual called in and said that none of these lectures are radical. None of them are going beyond the, what we expect. There's a certain tenor of it. And I think um, you've definitely taken it outside of the norm for the past 30 years. No criticism to what we've seen in the past 30 years. Very, very um, healthy um, discourse. But I think you certainly brought it into a, a completely different sphere. Maybe it's a good thing that they didn't choose another economist to give the lecture tonight. But um, I, I wanted to um, ask you about the issue of, of self-hate and, and tying that to knowledge of self. Uh, and I, I think back to the fact that when Sartre Lewis was at um, Mona, I believe, um, and there was this issue with the Rastafarian community, he, he made the point of, of seeking out knowledge and understanding of the Rastafarian movement, whereas at that time there was a, a, a clear um, issue with black power yes. and, and that cultural shock. And, and perhaps it was because his, his parents were Garveyites and he had that appreciation, that, that grounding and understanding of the importance of it. He, as a, as a good social scientist, decided that, look, you have to study and understand. And there's so much self-hate that we are dealing with um, across the Caribbean, um, across the African diaspora around the world. We still, you, you mentioned Haiti, and, and you, you ask the average Caribbean person about Haiti, they have a negative attitude towards Haiti. They don't want to do anything with, with Haitians. You know, you, you, you ask them about Africa, and they tend to have a negative attitude. The first reaction is tends to be negative, except now everybody likes Afrobeat, so it's becoming popular. But, but traditionally, there has not been that acceptance of self. We don't like ourselves. We don't like... Bajans, we don't like Trinis, Trinis don't like small islanders. We, we create these barriers to ourselves continuously. And it is, in fact, clearly what is keeping us back as, as a people. And, you know, and given the fact that we're now seeing that this is supposed to be the century of Africa, Africa is going to have a billion people, um, and we here in the Caribbean, we're still fighting ourselves, and we still haven't gotten onto that that bridge to understand, look, everybody's fleeing, um, flying towards Africa. Everybody wants to get in there. Everybody wants to um, tie in with their business. But we here, we're still hating ourselves. We're still hating our neighbors. We're still hating the products that we have. I mean, you mentioned the, the, the coconuts. And I don't know, the, um, one of the top five trends this year is that um, we may see the legalization of psychedelics. So it's interesting that the world has come so full circle on issues of marijuana. We're still hating ourselves over marijuana. We still are hating ourselves over issues of, even issues like cocaine. And we see the drug war that is being fought all around the world right now for those drugs which are being produced out of coca, which is a tropical product going to the temperate climes, right? And, and, and the, the, the conflicts and the killing that we see as a result of that. So I want you to, Talk about that issue of, of, of overcoming that, that destruction that we talk about that we need to do with the issue of self-hate. A very interesting question. Very interesting question. Um, I don't know that it's the only reason for our not moving forward, but I think it's at the heart of it. Um, nothing that we do is good enough because we have been told that we cannot do anything good. Look at Sir Arthur and Derek Walcott. Look at Sir Arthur and Derek Walcott, two brilliant. Um, praised all over the world. People sought them when they were alive to, to do things. In St. Lucia, I know that a man is not staying in his own but it has taken 30 years. It has taken 30 years. It, it has taken 30 years for us to get to this point. 
where somebody can tell you that we have to uproot the system. It has taken 30 years. Um, it has, independence has not done for us what it should have done. And that was to build us up as a people. And it's, I'm not saying that it is our fault either. I'm not putting blame on anybody or any government, etc. I am saying that we have been in survival mode for so long that we are not recognizing the possibilities that are available to us. Um, you, get, you, get, you get the questions about yourself. I remember when I got the appointment as ambassador to CARICOM and OECS, I met someone who said to me, I hope you are going to straighten your hair. You cannot represent the country if your hair like this. Okay? Because there's a certain image that an ambassador must have, and it's certainly not this hair. You know? And, and so we, we don't like the things that are about us. The things, because we have been told the things about us are not good. Not good. So we bleach our skins. Because if our skin is fairer, then we are more acceptable. But there is a historical basis for that. In the French territories during enslavement, there were 164 shades of color to get you as far away from being black as possible. So there was a whitening of the race, or there's a whitening of the race that is taking place to make us feel more acceptable. There is still discrimination against our darker-skinned brothers and sisters. So none of us want to, to marry somebody who is darker than them because you want your children to have good hair or you want them to, but it is, it is a, <laughs> you want them to have a fair chance at survival in a world that discriminates against certain things. So I'm not saying that it is right or it is wrong. I am saying that we have to find ways of building that self-awareness within our school system, within our school system, for us to be able to rise above that everything that comes out of Africa is diseased, you know, or not good, or that Haiti only has ghettos. I mean the culture, the, the, the art, the creativity of a people who have shown us what resilience means, means nothing to us because Haiti was the first black republic and it should not have survived. And there has been systematic, yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting echoes. <laughs> we, there, there has been systematic destruction of that country by colonial powers. Haiti is the country where every colonial power came together. So the French never got along with the British or with the Spanish and so on. But in Haiti, all of them came together to destroy Haiti. You, so you understand, you understand why we have these challenges in Haiti. And I am not sure why our Caribbean countries are not taking a stronger stance on Haiti. Taking a stronger stance on removing what is happening in Haiti. The same thing that they did in Africa and, and they're trying to do in Africa, they are doing in Haiti. So Haiti has gold, Haiti has diamonds, Haiti has oil. And all the land is being bought by Americans. And so you're going to destroy the country, remove the people who fought for their freedom, and you are going to replace them with rich Americans who will exploit the resources of the country. We have to do something about it. We cannot sit back and continue to let Haiti suffer. We can't. Again, it will take all of us to do it. But we have to then appreciate the value of things like the Haitian Revolution. We have to, uh, we have to um, for us to be able to 
rebuild our civilization and to look at development differently. We have to think about these things. So I'm very, I don't know that I gave you an answer, but I, I like my ramblings. <laughs> Good night to everyone. Hello, Dr. Good Sum. Good night. Um, I am looking at the topic and reacting to some of the questions we had. And I've, having been to so many Sir Arthur Lewis lectures and lectures on development, my question, why do we continue to set up ourselves for these okay. kinds of forums where people ask questions like, why aren't we developing? The right to development. Why not the right to define our own path to development or our own development alternative? Because as the discussion tonight, as you have pointed out, why are we trying to catch up? Why are we trying to go back to normal? the whole mirage of development that we are so en um, um, enamored with, we have said and we continue to say at all these lectures, it's not working for us. So where is the lecture where we define our path to development or our development alternative? We continue to pursue alternatives to a development that was not defined by us. So we want to move from bananas to the next gold, from green gold to the next gold. Why aren't we taking some of Lewis's subtle approaches to realize, as you rightly said, you don't have the answer, but you suspect. We need to challenge something. We need to burn something. And Lewis started by burning something. In 1945, the post-colonial world was sold this mirage of development. You can develop like us too. What did Lewis do? Yes, he was an economist, but he put down his economic models and he sought to answer the question, how do we in the post-colonial world develop like them? How do we make our independence meaningful? And my question to you and every other person is the same question I have to myself, and hopefully I will have with Lewis in the afterlife, is when he realized that these countries, in their history of development, were able to save 10 to 12 percent. He asked the question, how is it possible? Did he answer it? No. He realized that the solution to their development was linked to their rate of savings. And he posed the question to the post-development, the um, colonial world, how do we attain that same rate of savings? When have we done it? Who has done it? Louis didn't answer the question. And in my mind, in my imaginary conversations with Louis, I was like, oh, you got them, right? Because they cheated. And I'm taking us now to the Nobel Laureate Committee's theme, celebrating excellence, nurturing our creativity, consolidating our legacy. They celebrate the legacy of cheating, of not paying for labor. That's how they save, 10 to 12%. Did Louis dare to say it? He's smarter than that. But he gave us all the evidence. If you read his work, the evidence is there. He knew how they did it. So why are we trying to follow them and we don't have a dirty secret like them? Right? So for me, I came because I wanted, as I always go to these sessions to do, to see when are we going to challenge the notion of development? When are we going to define our development alternative? We don't want a post-COVID economy that puts us back on that trajectory. We shouldn't want it. I don't want it. I was never on it in the first place. Why are we going to leave here tonight thinking that 
when we celebrate our excellence, we are going to continue to cel celebrate the elitism that the Ministry of Education promotes in common entrance and all of that, and makes TVET substandard. We have to celebrate excellence in all fields. Unless we have an education system that celebrates excellence in everything, the elitism will persist, and the inequality that the education system perpetuates will continue. So, what is our legacy we want to consolidate? The legacy of wanting to follow in their footsteps and mimic their development pattern? Or a legacy of our ancestors who did burn things for their freedom? So let us put aside that development model. Let us define our development model. And you said it, COVID gave us the opportunity to think of where we want to go. Gave us the opportunity to pursue sustainable food security in our agricultural sector. Where was the agricultural sector revolution? Where was the development aid post, during and post COVID that is allowing us to pursue food security? Perpetuating dependency in a pandemic. And we're not making noise, we're not building that. Wonderful, wonderful, thank so, you. So. Thanks for that contribution. <laughs> thank you so much for that contribution. Um, I am always thankful for Dr. Suma's contributions. <laughs> I like Louis. She's refreshing. She's a historian, but you sit here tonight and you didn't know that. He was an economist and he sounded like a historian and a social development practitioner. And we need to think outside the box. Louis demonstrated that. He didn't stick to his path. Dr. Sumer has done the same. And I, as a social policy analyst and development planner, am not subscribing to the status quo. Challenge you. Let Thank us define you. our path to development. Thank you very much for that for that contribution. Oh, I am I'm, I'm very happy for this submission. Um, I, I want us to think outside of the box. Yes, I, I am not an economist. I keep saying that. But I can see the, um, the connections that Lewis was trying to make. You can see the connections. You can see that he's not just an economist, that he's a, a social scientist who understands the system. Maybe, like everybody else says, he didn't go, he didn't go far enough. But he was working within the context of the times. And I think that may, maybe if he had lived in a different time, like now, he might have been bold enough to see the things that we are seeing now. But in a system where you are the first black man to be a development economist. You are the first black man to get the opportunity to work in the colonial office at that level. You are the first black man to get the, the, the opportunity to teach at LSC or in Manchester, you know, etc. And still you come up with innovative ideas and solutions. You can just imagine, you know, the one thing I, I wanted to do and I didn't get a chance to do was to go and look at the, the CIA records on Lewis because you can be sure they were watching him. You can be sure that they were watching him because he was coming up with things that other people were not saying and he was brave enough to say them. So I think that's my next, my next lecture, the CIA and Sir Arthur Lewis. <laughs> But no, I am I'm very pleased. I'm, I'm glad that you know this illusion, that you are looking for alternatives, and you hopefully that you will be able to help us to find the answers that we're looking for. Definitely, we'll be looking forward to it. <laughs> At this point in time, we'll take our last question or comment from Dr. Adrian Oje. Oh, Pablo won't I will not deny Pablo a question. That is fine. That is absolutely fine. So the final question will come from... Thank you, um, Dr. Suma. You know I was having a perfectly relaxed evening at home. <laughs> My blood pressure was normal. And then you get me all riled up with this revolutionary talk and I want to 
kidnap you, take you up into the hills and ferment revolution and come back down like a negma with my cutlass and my flambo and overturn the whole damn system because I'm so freaking sick of it. And we're in our what year, Your Excellency? 30. Yeah. And, it, and she has a point. Yes. Because we know what's wrong. We know what's wrong. At least some of us know what's wrong. At least some of us think we know what's wrong. And we keep talking about it. But there's no commitment to change. There's no commitment to fundamental change. And I have a lot to say, but I'm going to cut it short. At some point, the people who extract from this... We're not hearing you. Sorry, not my fault. <laughs> The people who extract $1.8 billion from this economy every year and produce zero growth need fired. And I'm not talking about some industry, I'm talking about the government. Government is an extractive process that takes money out of the pockets of citizens subsidizes the whores of have at the expense of the huddles of have not, impoverishes everybody by doing at substandard what should be doing at a level of excellence. Including not teaching us history, not teaching us geography, not teaching us literature, and so in the absence of knowledge, we are the fools. And so it is impossible to develop a strategy for our own survival, for our own enlightenment, for our own prosperity. So we become the vassals of whoever wishes to rape us. And that is the truth of the economic model that we are pursuing. And until the government, which controls the largest single spot of resources in the country, takes a more enlightened approach to the development of the country and its own responsibility as leaders. We'll be having these lectures and not much will change. But Dr. Suma, anytime you're ready to go up into the hills and sharpen some cutlers, call me. I'm ready. Thank you. All right, we have our final contribution before we end. Well, I ain't ready to burn down. I ain't ready to go to cut cutlass on But just as I was listening to you, something kept on coming to my mind. The, in our field, in religion, they say one of the problems is that people have taken Jesus Christ and made him into a Christian. And I was just sensing as though somehow Sir Arthur has been domesticated. So people have presented us with an Arthur Lewis that they want us to accept. But you are suggesting that in fact really only the kind of developmental economics economists that they presented, but he's much more than that. That he's much more radical. That his, and his radicality, his radicalness, we are not being permitted to discover it, but we are, they've, they've, they've domesticated him. It's just something I sense, I don't know if, you know? Because from what people are saying, Afalu said this, Afalu said this, Afalu said this, Afalu said that. And yet still, from you I'm sensing and from others who have sensed, like as though our fellow is much more than that. You are being given or you're, you're discovering only what they want to discover. <laughs> or they're promoting only what they want you to promote rather than the real man. Just a thought. You know? Thank you for that thought. I'm glad that I helped to access Lewis a little more tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Suma, for your responses to the comments and questions. Thank you so much to the audience 
for these brilliant comments and questions. So I would like you to give yourself a round of applause at this point in time. At this point in time, we move to the presentation of tokens. And I would like to invite Deputy Chair, Ms. Ms. Fortuna Anthony, so that she could give and make a presentation to our esteemed lecturer. Thank you very much for that. At this point in time, we'd like to invite the principal of the Safa Lewis Community College to present a token of appreciation to Dame Paulette Louisie in, commer in commemoration of the 30th anniversary of the Nobel Laureate Festival. Um, I have to admit this year um, is the largest turnout I have seen for the Sir Arthur Lewis <laughs> Memorial Lecture. Uh, now, it may have been because of the, you know, I mean, great minds thinking and asking and inviting um, Dr. Honorable Dr. Suma to, to deliver um, this year's lecture. Um, but it could be that we are getting there. Um, after 30 years, you know, unfortunately, we take a long time to get to where we want to go. And um, it has taken us 30 years to get a full um, audience like this. So um, thank you, all the um, event coordinators, Sir Louis, CDF, the community, um, the communities of, of Grosile, Babuno, Canary, Soufre, Beaufort, um, Labry, you can't forget Labry, who, <laughs> who have joined us this year to celebrate 30 years of recognizing excellence. Now, um, the theme we've been, been using for a few years now is 
celebrating excellence, and every year, um, so this year when we said um, nurturing our creativity, but consolidating our legacy, we was ready to say that we have within ourselves what it takes to bring us where we want to be. So let's nurture that. And in so doing, we are going to build on the legacy. So that was the, the nurturing I was talking about. That's the legacy I was talking about. Our legacy. Not other people's, but, but ours. So um, I look forward to, while I'm saying that, you know, um, to next year's um, <laughs> uh, 31, 32, 33. And um, between now and next year, um, January, let's really see us celebrating ourselves and celebrating the excellence that lies within us. Let us unleash the potential within us and let us be the people that we can be. And just to borrow everybody's phrase, let us be the better version of ourselves or something like that. But, um, you know, but let's do it, St. Lucians. Thank you very much. At this point in time, we invite Mrs. Soraya Best Joseph to present a token of appreciation to Mr. Cedric Charles, the BOSL team. Yes. Um, that is my turn now. Oh, it's her turn as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Both of us want it first. Okay. Thank you for to our sponsors. Um, without them, as you all know, none of this would be possible. And they are all always ready to support. So I think we need to show our 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 support for our May I say anytime we're in a jam or anything. Just say we know who we have to go to, and they're always there. So I have to say, keep saying it. All of our committee knows that. So I, I can't even express how grateful we are for the continued support. Thank you. And in our case, we say, don't burn by. Yes. <laughs> To our esteemed alumni, to our you represent, we try to use our students in many of these activities and we, we look for them to make sure we recognize and appreciate what they've become to be. And so, in helping out your, your college, you see, Thank you for tonight. Thank you for agreeing to be the moderator and doing an excellent job and being the firefighter for all the bullies who want to do it. Okay, so thank you so very much. I know, I know, you try, you try. Okay, so thank you for a wonderful job. All right. So at this point in time, we. I invite Mrs. Menal to, to deliver the vote of thanks. Can you please switch hands together for Mrs. Menal? Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by quoting a portion of a verse of scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse, 5, sorry, verse 18, which says, In everything, give thanks. I am humbled and honored to deliver this vote of thanks to such a great crowd of witnesses. On behalf of the Board of Governors, management, and staff of the South Louis County College, I wish to express profound thanks, profound gratitude to Your Excellency, 
Mr. Cyril Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, for your presence here. The Chairperson of the National Nobel Laureate Festival Committee, Your Excellency Dame Paulette Louise, Governor, Generous, Governor General Emerita of St. Lucia, for your dedication and commitment to our National Nobel Laureate Festival activities. You have been the driving force behind all of these celebrations. Thanks are also extended to the National Committee and affiliated organizations for your support. Heartfelt thanks to our presenter, your Honorable Dr. June, Honorable Dr. June Suma. We are extremely proud that this daughter of the soil <laughs> this daughter of the soil making and has made her mark on the international scene. An alumna of Sir Arthur Lewis College herself, the then Teachers College, former board member of Sir Arthur Lewis County College. We are proud that she was able to share an inspiring and thought-provoking presentation. Channeling our thinking, view Sir Arthur with other lenses, and not just as an economist, but the other facets which define the man, an activist, an advocate, anti-imperialist, and a true public intellectual. To our moderator, Mr. Jovan Lewis, Another product of South Louis County College, we say thank you for a job well done. We recognize the generosity of our main sponsors, Bank of St. Lucia, who has consistently risen to the occasion in sponsoring this event. Thank you. Our co-sponsor, Massey Stores St. Lucia Limited, for jumping on board with your sponsorship and kind contribution. Merci. Special thanks to the NTN and GIS management and technical team. Our gratitude to Ms. Janelle Henry for such a beautiful rendition. How appropriate. The hero lies in you. Appreciation of the Sir Arthur Lewis County College Nobel Laureate Committee, of whom I am chair, particularly the staff of the Office of the Principal for your undaunting support and hard work. Our de dedicated decorating personnel, hats off to you. Our marketing and communication staff, technicians, ushers, and security personnel, thank you. Finally, to you, the esteemed guests, officials, Kiwanis in their full numbers, the general public, and everyone else for your attendance and participation. If I left out anyone, please forgive me. And once again, a big thank you to all of you, without whom this event would not have been a success. Bon soiree. Thank you for that vote of thanks, Mrs. Dolores Daniel Menal, Chair of the Safa Lewis Community College Nobel Laureate Festival Committee. At this point in time, I invite everyone to stand for the departure of the Governor General. With this, we come to the end of this evening's program. I bid a good evening to our online audience, to our in-house audience. Please get home safely and allow me to invite you for some light refreshments that are provided. So have a good evening, everyone. Take care.